Um, now, maritime archaeologists study ships and boats, and I think that we're probably all comfortable about that. We know how to value the remains of a ship and its material assemblage. But what happens when we also encounter archaeological sites that speak to us about other, perhaps more difficult things? Now, the wrecks of three American Civil War blockade runners, the Iona 1 you can see on the left, the Iona 2, that lovely uh, uh, drawing that we're all familiar with on the right, and also um, the Lelia, are the archaeology of British support for the Confederacy and its exploitation of enslaved persons. And they have been given uh, protection off the UK coast. Now, through the story of the most recent of these, the Lelia in Liverpool Bay, I'm going to attempt to e examine the difficult stories that these wrecks tell us about our past, as well as whether and how our approach to them as archaeologists could and perhaps should change uh, in the era of uh, Black Lives Matter. Given the subject of this conference, the elephant in the room will be the fact that the Lelia is not actually a Protection of Wrecks Act protected wreck, but is instead scheduled. I'll therefore also discuss the reasons why, in my personal opinion, I should stress, the use of scheduling has already become the default option for wreck protection in English territorial waters, by which I mean that part of the UK territorial waters off the English coast. Now, I'm also going to talk about Liverpool, and not everything I will have to say will reflect particularly well upon the history of that great maritime city. Now, the warm hearted and friendly people of Liverpool can be rather sensitive to criticism that does not come from one of their own. So, whilst I would not claim to be a, uh, a Liverpudlian, um, I should say that I am from a Liverpool family, and I'm a descendant of that classic mix of late 19th century Scottish, Irish and Welsh immigrants who will be familiar to many from the city. I should also add, given what I will be talking about, that I am a very, very uh, distant, uh, well, I am probably a very, very distant, but direct descendant of the 18th century union between an enslaved person and a member of a Caribbean plantation owning family. Now, the wreck of the Lelia lies at a general depth of about 17 metres here in Liverpool Bay, close to the Burbo Bank offshore wind farm and seaward of the bar, the entrance to the main approach channel to the Port of London. The wreck was found during the investigation of Kingfisher Report in the 1990s by Liverpool University scientist and avocational archaeologist and wreck investigator Chris Michael, and he uh, recovered uh, this bell. I'm grateful to him for the use of this photograph and um, subsequently acted as a champion for the site, defended it get from uncontrolled recoveries by the local diving community by claiming salver in possession. In 1997, it was visited by the archaeological diving unit during one of the annual perambulations around the UK. It didn't rock their boat and the wreck was not protected. However, they encountered superb and therefore highly unusual underwater visibility uh, for this location during the very slack water experienced on the site, which meant that the video they shot was to prove invaluable for the reassessment 20 years later that did lead to the site's protection. Now, awareness that the rich shipwreck heritage of Liverpool Bay had not perhaps received the attention it deserved led historic England to focus greater effort on it in the early 21st century. And in 2016, the decision was taken to reassess the site with a short program of desk-based and fieldwork investigation undertaken by an archaeological contractor with the help of Mr. Michael. 
Contacts in the marine survey community established that a Mersey-based survey company, Bibi Hydromap, formerly Osiris Projects, had for many years carried out training and equipment calibration on the site. And the assessment in this presentation itself has benefited very greatly from the georeference multi-beam images you can see here that they were able to provide. These and the ADU video gave the assessment a very clear preview of the site, enabling a subsequent and very short two-dive inspection to focus on the detailed uh, recording of a very small number of key points within the rack. The work was a success, and Historic England's recommendation that wrecks should be protected was subsequently actioned in the usual rather leisurely government way. You can see that from these uh, Bibby uh, multi-beam images that the site consists of partially intact and infilled remains of the lower hull of a paddle steamer. The single uh, deck has gone, leaving the remains of one of the two oscillating steam engines. I hope you can see my mouse um, and two sets of box boilers. And that is a funnel uptake. Now, some damage is evident and it appears likely that a large anchor has been dragged into the wreck at some point, possibly from the adjacent commercial anchorage, uh, denting the hull uh, here and probably destroying uh, one of the oscillating engines here and then as well as ripping through one of the boilers here. You can see that the multi-beam is sufficiently good to make that fairly plain. The paddle wheel on the other side survived. Um, uh, <clears throat> at least in 2016 when the field work was done. Now, in a manner not unfamiliar to those who know the similar paddle steamer Iona 2 of Lundy, survival of parts of the ship forward and after the boiler and machinery spaces here and here um, is much more sketchy. And current theories about which end is the bow and which the stern rest upon Mr. Michael's recollection that he found anchor chain the northwest end. Now, the site has not been subject to any excavation that I've heard of, at least uh, not of uh, an archaeological kind. Now, as I mentioned at the start of this presentation, there is an elephant in the room, in the context of the theme of this NAS conference, and that is that the Lelia is not a protected wreck. It has instead been scheduled as a monument and the Ancient Monuments and Archaeological Areas Act 1979, which we call the 1979 Act. Now, this schematic from the excellent Historic England Selection Guide for Boats and Ships shows the relationship between the three types of protection, listing, scheduling, and designated wrecks. Archaeologists used to working on terrestrial sites will, of course, recognize scheduling, the main means of protecting vulnerable archaeological sites. And until a few years ago, it's used to protect fully marine, i.e. fully sub submerged wreck sites, was rare. There was and I should stress, this is very much a personal view of somebody on the outside who has carried out related archaeological work for a couple of decades. A uh, prevailing, uh, if you could say, party line at Historic England that scheduling was for land and PWA for water. There was quite significant resistance to the idea of using scheduling for holy marine wreck sites. However, that seems to have changed in recent years. For example, the emigrant ship Josephine Willis of Folkestone that's been in the news has been scheduled, as has the wreck of uh, the similarly newsworthy Royal Navy pre-dreadnought battleship HMS Montague off Lundy, close to the Iona 2, and the wrecks of two American landing ships lost in a disastrous D-Day practice exercise in Lime Bay off Devon. There are a few others. 
So why has this been done? Well, leaving aside individual site considerations, the key drawback of using the Protection of Rex Act to protect a Rex site such as the Lelia is that activity on the site then needs to be licensed. Now, at a time when historic England budgets are under considerable pressure and likely to remain so for the foreseeable, the administrative burden of licensing represents a significant disincentive for using the Protection of Rex Act. Whilst there are still processes and permissions associated with uh, some activity on scheduled sites, the administrative burden associated with them is considerably less. Furthermore, scheduling does not require a statutory process, uh, making it easier and certainly quicker to schedule a rec site a form of protection and national management that also has the advantage from a curatorial perspective, drawing historic rec sites into the same managerial framework as the vast majority of nationally recognized archeological sites. As a result, in my personal view, scheduling has or is becoming the default means of protecting historic wreck sites, uh, such as the Lelia, in English territorial waters, with designation under the Protection of Wrecks Act likely to become a fairly sparingly used alternative for especially vulnerable sites. From the perspective of both professional and avocational archaeologists involved in the study, the use of scheduling eventually results in significantly more historic wreck sites being designated than in the long time. These sites may morph from their current status as a, a very small, highly specialized and slightly other historic asset class into something with greater recognition and therefore access to funding, maybe. Now, the Lelia was a Liverpool ship and was built in 1864 by the established firm of William Miller and Sons at the shipyard in Toxter, an area known as Liverpool South Docks. Nothing appears to remain of this shipyard today. We cannot really understand the design of this ship and why Millers chose to be involved in its construction without understanding the role for which it was constructed and Liverpool's central role, uh, central part in that role. Now, in 1861, long-standing tensions within the United States about slavery and many other issues boiled over into civil war. The largely agricultural Confederate Southern secessionist states faced off against the more industrialized Northern federal states um, in a conflict that we all now know as the American Civil War. Cataclysmic and bloodily traumatic, uh, that war nevertheless led to the abolition of slavery in the US. It was a key event in the slow and uh, frankly painful progress of civil rights for black Americans. The beginning of the war, the Confederacy lacked the manufacturing capability to sustain that war with the more industrialized Northern Union. It therefore found itself having to support to import war supplies, including guns and ammunition, in order to sustain its war effort. With its agricultural economy denied access to northern markets, it also found itself even more dependent on the southern states' existing raw cotton export trade with Europe, and particularly with Britain and France. However, this trade was vulnerable to disruption by the Union Navy, uh, which had inherited almost all of the warships of the pre-war state. The Union, of course, knew this. 1861 imposed a naval blockade of the main Confederate ports in an attempt to strangle the Southern War effort. You can see on the upper left the uh, great snake that the Confederacy referred to the naval blockade as. Now, the Confederacy responded to the blockade by building ironclads to defeat the blockading fleets and commerce raiders to sink Union shipping. Neither of these strategies proved to be successful. They also acquired fast steamships, mainly paddle steamers, from British and other shipbuilders. 
hoping that these could breach the blockade by a combination of speed and stealth, carrying cotton uh, and tobacco out and war supplies in. Operating from neutral islands off the southern states, including Bermuda, Nassau and Havana, the blockade runners were at first uh, operated largely on a laissez-faire ba basis by Confederate businessmen, but increasingly came under the direct control of their government. Initially, it proved relatively easy to run the blockade and the Union Navy came under heavy criticism. However, as the war progressed, the blockade became more and more effective and the risks therefore much greater. And by the end of the war, about 1,500 blockade runners had been captured or destroyed, uh, uh, including one in two of those that tried in 1865. Nevertheless, during the whole war, an average of five out of six runners is thought to have got through. However, as these ships were built for speed rather than cargo capacity, as far fewer ships were able to call at southern ports, the blockade uh, reduced southern trade to about one third of its pre-war levels. Whilst it didn't win the war for the north, it did play an important part in its eventual victory. The beginning of the war, Liverpool was Britain's leading port for long distance trade. It was ideally placed for trade with North America and with industrial hinterland heavily dependent upon imports of raw cotton from the southern states. Uh, the city had a, a very long standing political, financial and emotional tie with uh, those southern states. As a result, it uh, was often said that more Confederate flags flew over Liverpool than over the Confederate capital. Now, despite official British neutrality, these sympathies and the law of the huge profits that could be made meant that the Confederacy found Liverpool's merchant banking, shipbuilding and seafaring uh, population more than happy to assist it in building and operating blockade runners. And first, that included the building of warships, such as the Alabama. Uh, but this eventually became too embarrassing for the British government. Now, the city shipbuilders, early adopters in iron and steel construction and the steam power necessary, um, therefore concentrated on building blockade runners. Much attention was devoted to concealing the true purpose of these ships. But it was usually an open secret and diplomats and a network of spies based at the U.S. consular monitored uh, uh, this uh, activity and breach of British neutrality. Now, the scale of British and in particular Liverpool involvement in running is readily apparent in a letter written by the U.S. Con uh, consul in Liverpool uh, in 1865, when he stated that in previous 12 uh, months, 130 steamship, uh, sorry, 113 steamships known to be intended for blockade running had sailed from the port and that 11 more new builds had been launched and were being made ready to sail. 42 of that total were Liverpool ships, second only to uh, Glasgow ships. And he reported that most of the cotton brought out of the Confederacy was destined to pass through uh, Liverpool. Now, in 1862, you'll see on the lower left, the Daily Digest newspaper was not alone in declaring dire consequences for Britain if the Union blockade was successful. However, its impact is quite complicated to entangle. The initial impact and the deliberate withholding of cotton by the South in order to in, uh, encourage Britain and France to intervene mil militarily, known as King Cotton Diplomacy, was blunted by a glut of pre-war cotton. And whilst a cotton famine did take hold in 1862 and 1863, its uh, impact was uh, mitigated by the growth in other manufacturing and a flourishing war material trade with the northern states, who in turn provided a great deal of the corn on which uh, Britain fed itself. Uh, those who undoubtedly did benefit from the blockade were the shipbuilders of Glasgow and Liverpool, British Confederate businessmen who financed it. Running could also be immensely lucrative those to those on board vessels like the Lelia.
As cotton prices soared to six to ten times their pre-war prices, captains could make uh, $5,000 or or more in gold per round trip, and even the lowest members of the crew could make uh, $250. Stopping the runners could also be rewarding in terms of prize money with the captain of one Union gunboat making $40,000 out of two captured runners in 1864. Now, the Lelia was ordered from Millers by William Crenshaw and Co., a Liverpool shipping firm owned by Confederate artillery officer of the same name. It's a purpose-built steel blockade runner. It's typical the mature design of such late war ships being sleek, fast, shallow drafted and low in profile. And it was built for the last stage of the journey into southern ports, not for the rigors of an Atlantic or even Irish Sea crossing that was ultimately to cost the Lelia dear. As usual, Union spies give us a uh, very uh, good description of the ship. And with 460 tons of coal crammed into it and cargo, including army spades and other supplies, it set sail from Liverpool on 14th of January 1865, nominally under the command of Captain Thomas Skinner, a Virginia native who fronted matters with his British master's certificate, but in reality, probably under the effective command, one of the listed passengers, Arthur Sinclair, an experienced Confederate naval officer. There's some evidence the crew were inexperienced and unused to working together, and there was a certain amount of disorganization about the loading and preparation of the ship. It's also unclear whether Skinner and Sinclair were wise to head out into what was t- clearly a deteriorating weather picture. But they did, and they were struck by one of the notorious Irish Sea gales. The low freeboard of the ship, exacerbated by the heavy loading, meant that it quickly began to ship heavy seas. And although Though an attempt to return to Liverpool was made, these seas eventually ripped off hatch covers. The resulting flooding forced the crew to abandon with only 12 survivors. This was not the end of the disaster, unfortunately, because an attempt to tow the Liverpool lifeboat out to the life ship to rescue the survivors um, ended in it capsizing, drowning seven of its crew. Now, blockade runners have an undeniable connection with slavery. They were built for profit and out of sympathy for the cause, specifically to carry war materials into Confederate ports to sustain a war that was fought in a very significant part to defend the existence of slavery in the southern states. They brought the product of enslaved labor, cotton, out. They were built by shipbuilders who might, just over a half century earlier, have been building slave ships, financed by those who might have been paying for voyages in the triangular trade and who worked in a country that had only recently abolished, relatively recently abolished slave ownership. They were crewed by men whose fathers, grandfathers and great-grandfathers may have sailed slave ships in an era in which many of us are inclined uh, uh, to tear down from plinth statues of those involved in the enslavement of people. Should we therefore be putting the wrecks of blockade runners up on metaphorical plinths by designating or scheduling them? Of course, we are sensitive to this issue. Historic England's official list entry for the Lelia makes the central connection between the wreck of the ship and blockade running crystal clear. It talks of cotton, of clandestine support of the Confederacy, of complicity in running the blockade. And yet the list entry does not refer to slavery at all. Trust me, I've done a word search. Why is this? Well, in saying that I must also put my hand up as author of the advice that led to the Lelia's scheduling, um, looking back at the document I wrote in 2017 as part of the team that assessed this, I I find that whilst the connection between slavery and the Lelia is briefly discussed elsewhere in the document, it is not referred to in the non-statutory criteria assessment, criteria that we all know. I was not even alert to the possible significance, good or bad, that the flags in this picture of the grave of Arthur Sinclair represents. If I was writing the same assessment today, after uh, the uh, beginning of the Black Lives Matter uh, protests, would I be saying 
something different as a result. Well, we must remember the connections we may uh, that the connections uh, we, we may need to make require some sort of physical embodiment in the rack. And that sort of connection can be quite elusive or uncertain. The wreck of the Douro, a Liverpool ship lost in 1843, the Alza Sili, supposedly en route for Portugal, the only wreck site that seems to be mentioned within historic England's web pages on the slave trade and abolition, has produced significant quantities of manilas, bracelet shaped uh, tra bronze trading tokens, traditionally used to trade for enslaved people in West Africa. Yet the ship's status as a possible illegal uh, slaver remains rather speculative. Now, Historic England and his English Heritage have done good work to assess the legacy of the slave trade within England's historic environment. Whether enough has been done in English territorial waters is open to question. Personally, I think the answer is likely to be no. But should we do this? Well, yes, I believe, of course, yes, we should. Shipwreck heritage is not just for the small uh, interest group um, that we represent with our archaeological preoccupations, uh, with the design and function of ships. However, I think that wrecks like the Lelia and the stories they tell us about British support for slave-owning post-abolition tell us that we need to think outside of the narrow confines of the slave trade and slave ships and look at the broader impact of slavery on our maritime heritage and consider how direct and tangible those links need to be. For example, if the wreck of HMS Mistletoe, lost in 1816 off the Isle of Wight, were ever to be found, how important would the fact that there is evidence uh, that it was the product of enslaved labour in the Hamilton Parish shipyards of Bermuda, uh, namely the 50-year-old Corker and Carpenter Sam and the 19-year-old Corker and Carpenter Tom, be to us? We do also need to consider carefully the whole story. Group value as a criteria can take into account links with other types of physical monuments and landscape. We need to consider links uh, between terrestrial scheduled monuments and listed buildings and our wrecks. Building on work done by Historic England to look at the built heritage legacy of the slave trade and of ab abolition in cities and towns connected with the trade all over England. Case of the Lelia, uh, that includes the grave of Arthur Sinclair, of course, the former U.S. consulate in Liverpool, and properties associated with Fraser, Trenholm & Co., foreign bankers to the Confederacy. Uh, right. Now, I was going to end this presentation that I've rather galloped through with a poster image from the 1930s Hollywood blockbuster Gone with the Wind that glamorized the Southern Plantation Society that block ru blockade running briefly sustained. It starred Vivian Lee as Scarlett O'Hara and Clark Gable as Rhett Butler, the blockade running businessman who infamously told her that he couldn't give a damn, upon whose words the title of this presentation plays. Unfortunately, working out the niceties of the relevant copyright law as it applies in the UK did not prove as straightforward as I hoped. So whilst inviting you to consider whether you give a damn about what I have said in the last uh, 25 or so minutes, courtesy of the wonderful Imperial War Museum's online collection, I'm going to leave you with a version of that film poster that may be familiar to those of you who, like me, experienced the Cold War chemistry of Rhett Ronnie and Scarlet Maggie in the early 1980s. Thank you. Thank you, Graham. Thank you very much. Uh, appreciate keeping the to, to time. Uh, appreciate we started you ever so slightly late. Hopefully, you can see me. Uh, I, uh, I can. Yes. Excellent. Shall I stop sharing my screen? Uh, you can do. You can leave it up. Yeah. It's entirely up to you. Um, you can uh -huh. stop sharing, and we can then um, see you see you bigger. Um, if anybody has any questions for Graham, please do use the chat. Use the um, uh, Q&A panel either would be fine. Um, I'm going to start one, Graham, 
uh, if that's possible. In terms of you, you talked about the group value, and you talked about in terms of the connections to other monuments and other lands, you know, in the landscape. But you also talked about there being records of 113 steamships that were intended for blockade running and 42 of them being Liverpool. Have you done any research into the fates of the others? The short answer is no. Yeah, big, big undertaking. <laughs> the short and honest answer is um, I, I am aware that uh, there are the remains of um, other blockade runners around the UK coast. Um which is not that surprising because, again, they were, you know, small vessels not built for really for um, Atlantic crossings. Um, there is a, I forget its name, but there is a, the physical remains of a blockade runner, um, a, a second blockade runner at Lundy, uh, just off the northeast tip of the island, um, uh, which uh, I think uh, some uh, members of the NAS uh, may already be a, a, aware of, and which may, in fact, already be uh, have started to be investigated. I'm I'm not sure about that one. So they are there, and of course, it you know it connects us with um, U.S. maritime archaeology because there are certainly wrecks of blockade runners out there, and that's something that we perhaps haven't really explored. Uh, and something that would perhaps be a, a very good um, way to cooperate with our American colleagues, both professional and avocational. Uh, indeed. Um, uh, Nick has written, fascinating talk, Graham. It raises a lot of issues. It's interesting to draw parallels with land archaeology and the aspects of, he's put in inverted commas, dark heritage, uh, i.e. the archaeology of concentration camps and other aspects of World War II. Yes, I, I think when you enter, you know, I notice he's put it in um, uh, inverted commas. I think when you ent uh, when you start discussing um, uh, issues like this, uh, language and names and terminology becomes uh, immensely important and becomes an uh, an absolute minefield. Um, and uh, it it becomes very important that we do select. Um, uh, and discuss uh, the right terminology to use. There's plenty of people out there who can tell us about that, um, and we need to take our cue, cue from that. Um, yeah, it's caused me considerable um, <laughs> thought uh, uh, over the yeah. last few years. Yeah. OK, we, we, we sort of need to, to wrap up, but we, we were just um, uh, Alex and um, my, myself here and um, were listening to your very personal opinion about the designation the you know, scheduling versus protection uh, under the Protection of Rex Act and wondered whether sort of the future might look like something of a default position of scheduling first until significance or situations determine that actually extra levels of uh, protection through the PWA might be required in certain circumstances. Yeah, I, I, I think I'm probably not well qualified to comment on that. I, I'm very much an outsider. My the comments I've made have been based on observation and and just an understanding of the uh, you know budgetary pressures of the moment. Um, and they are very, very personal, uh, yeah. and the, the the comments of a of an outsider. Um, yeah, it'd be something that historic England could usefully yeah. comment on at, at yeah. some point. Uh, of course, there's an event on next week that of sadly on the twenty second. Yep. Yeah, I'm not going to be able to attend because of work in in Europe, but um, uh, they. Um, it is possible that yeah. uh, this sort of uh, comment uh, uh, is already intending to be addressed at that oh, meeting. Right. I'm sure. It I'm will. sure you'll hear. I'm sure you'll hear back as to how how the meeting on Wednesday, uh, how the event on Wednesday goes. Yes, I, I believe that for anybody uh, at this conference, if you register for that meeting, uh, it will entitle you, even if you can't to. to attend the event either online or in person it will uh, allow you to view recordings okay. of the day at a later date 
Rob, Rob, Rob from CIFA is with us. He might be able to comment on that in the chat for everybody. Um, okay, well, we have to leave it there. With um, Thank you, Graham. That is wonderful. Um, thank you for joining us, uh, for sending in um, your uh, abstract for consideration. And we, we realized it wasn't protected, but actually that didn't mean that it wasn't necessarily uh, an interesting topic to consider during the, the presentation, so uh, during the conference. So thank you very much, Graham. Um,